Greetings, my name is Barry Setterfield and welcome to part two of this presentation on new developments in science. In part one we discovered how plasma physics was able to answer a number of questions that have been raised by gravitational astronomy over the last 300 years. These problems included the rotation rate of galaxies and the rate at which stars and galaxies are formed. In part two today, we're looking at a form of energy which many folk are not aware of, but NASA and other scientists are actually involved in discussing this and finding out more about it and looking at ways of trying to harness it. This form of energy, the zero point energy, the ZPE, has the possibilities of answering a number of other problems which we have out there in space. And so let's begin our research on this one by talking about an experiment. Let us take a perfectly sealable flask and pump all solids, liquids and gases out of it. Once all this matter and all atoms have been removed, it is often assumed that there is then a perfect vacuum inside the flask. But it was discovered that this vacuum still contains and transmits heat radiation. So let us cool the flask down to zero degrees Kelvin that is absolute zero or about minus 460 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 273 degrees Celsius. And when we do this, the result is called a bare vacuum. However, in the early 20th century, theory and experiment both revealed that there was an energy there intrinsic to the vacuum. Because that energy exists even at absolute zero temperature in an actual vacuum, it has been called the zero-point energy. The real vacuum in which this exists is called the physical vacuum. This zero-point energy is made up of electromagnetic waves of all wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. However, the majority of them are at the short wavelength end of the spectrum, as seen here on the right. The zero-point energy, or ZPE, is everywhere in space and in everything in space. It permeates everything, including the Earth, our bodies, and all our equipment. It's like an all-pervasive sea. This raises the question of just how much ZPE there is in space. It is so much stronger than you can imagine. Take your everyday light bulb. It will radiate at a rate varying from 40 to 150 watts. A watt is a measure of the energy going through the light bulb per second. The sun radiates at about 3.8 by 10 to the 26 watts. That's 3,800 million, 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 million watts. Now understand that our sun is just a medium-sized star and only one star of about 150 billion stars in a typical galaxy like ours. If the radiation of each of these stars is about the same intensity as our sun, then the amount of energy expended by our entire galaxy of stars shining for 15 billion years is less than the energy locked up in one cubic centimetre of space. If that is the case, you might ask why we don't feel that much energy. We are not aware of the presence of the ZPE for the same reason we are not aware of the 14 pounds per square inch of pressure on our bodies from our atmosphere. It is balanced inside and out. The ZPE exists inside us and through us, including all our measuring devices. When we think of air pressure, we know that when we go below the surface of the ocean too far, the pressure outside of us becomes greater than the pressure inside us. When we climb mountains, the reverse happens. The air pressure outside us becomes less than the air pressure inside us, which we are used to. This is why our ears pop, even if we are only driving up a mountain. The zero-point energy is comprised of all different wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. It is the same inside and outside of us. Now visible light is only a small part of that electromagnetic spectrum. As a result, it may be wondered why we can see light from the sun or the stars or even the moon. 
The reason is that the intensity of the electromagnetic radiation coming from these objects is over and above that of the ZPE which surrounds and permeates us. Because of this difference, we are able to see the stars and the sun and the moon. If there were no differences in the radiation intensities anywhere, our world would appear black. There is a problem that the existence of the ZPE has solved. Before 2010, it had been established that it was impossible to know exactly where any subatomic particle was at any point in space or time. This became known as the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. This is one of the bases on which the quantum mechanics was built in the 1920s. However, there seemed to be no logical reason for this uncertainty, and so it was simply explained away as being a strange property of subatomic matter. Although the presence of the zero-point energy had been known since the early 1900s, it was not taken seriously as a matter of study until the 1960s. Then, years later, on the 6th of January 2010, it was discovered through experiments that the subatomic particles were jiggling because they were being continuously impacted by the ZPE waves. Thus, it turns out that all electrons are being hit at about 10 to the 20th times per second by these impacting waves. Here at last was a very reasonable physical explanation for the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. In the case of atoms making up electrical circuits, this jiggling creates an irreducible random noise in receivers. This noise places limits on signal amplification, no matter how good the technology may be. A number of scientists are hoping to use this noise to drive some type of motor. The jittering of subatomic particles is one piece of evidence for the existence of the zero-point energy. The random radio noise is another. But there is a third piece of data we can play with experimentally. Electromagnetic waves have a funny property. If they can't get a whole wave through the gap between two parallel plates, the wave itself just won't go through. So we can bring two metal plates closer and closer together in a vacuum until, without any visible assistance, they will slam together. That happens for two reasons. First, the ZPE has an incredibly large number of waves of all wavelengths. The second is that the waves that can't make it through the gap between the plates are still pushing on the plates from the outside. At the same time, the fewer waves which do make it through on the inside do not have enough pressure to resist the push of the excess number of outside waves, so the plates collapse. This excess pressure was accurately measured by Lamoureux in 1997 and by Mohadeen and Roy in November of 1998. It is called the Casimir effect. Even in the dark, in a vacuum which has been cooled to absolute zero, this effect exists, showing that nothing other than the ZPE waves can be causing this effect. By excluding some ZPE waves between the plates, the vacuum there is modified as the strength of the ZPE is lessened. This type of vacuum modification via the Casimir effect is also being considered as a source of energy under appropriate circumstances by NASA and other groups. There are a multitude of zero-point energy waves of all wavelengths travelling in all directions at once throughout space. This means that they run into each other. When this happens, it is something like waves on the ocean, which meet and then form whitecaps. These whitecaps appear and then quickly disappear. When the ZPE waves meet, they form concentrations of energy, which manifest for the briefest moment of time as something called virtual particle pairs. This is because energy and matter are interconvertible which means that they can change into each other. That is exactly what Einstein's famous equation tells us. These virtual particle pairs are coming into existence and then flashing out of existence as they slam back together in the tiniest moment of time. 
While they exist, one of the pair is negatively charged and the other positively. The resulting electrostatic attraction is why they slam back together. But at any instant in time, because the ZP is so enormous, there are about 10 to the 63 virtual particle pairs in existence in any given cubic yard of space. That is the numeral 1 followed by 63 zeros. Experiments confirming the existence of virtual particles were discussed in New Scientist on the 12th of February 2011. But there is something important about these charged virtual particle pairs. A charge in motion is an electric current, and every electric current is surrounded by a circling magnetic field. Every ZPE wave is in motion, and therefore their virtual particles are also in motion. That means there are thousands upon millions of electric currents and magnetic fields throughout even a small volume of space, let alone the whole universe. It is for this reason that we can say the zero-point energy, through its virtual particle pairs, is responsible for the electric and magnetic properties of space. The Casimir effect is relevant here. Because the ZPE strength between the Casimir plates is lower than outside the plates, there are fewer virtual particle pairs per unit volume between the plates than there are outside. This means, then, that the electric and magnetic properties of the vacuum between the plates is also different to outside. The electric and magnetic fields inside are less intense. This not only gives us a strong evidence of the reality of the zero-point energy, but it tells us that the very properties of space itself are different when the ZPE is different. To understand how the ZPE originated, consider this picture. When you stretch a rubber band, you invest the rubber band with your energy. When you blow up a balloon, you put your energy into the balloon. In the same way, when the universe itself was expanding, it was being invested with enormous amounts of energy. At this point, the energy itself is potential energy. It is not doing anything yet. The potential energy in the rubber band is converted to kinetic or movement energy when the rubber band is released. If a balloon is not tied and released, the transfer of potential to kinetic energy occurs as it flies around the room. Clearly, our universe did not fly off when potential energy converted to kinetic energy. Rather, the process took a couple of well-defined steps, but the potential energy of the stretching was converted to the kinetic energy of the zero-point energy. As we stated, this energy is all through space, even at absolute zero of temperature. As the conversion took place and the ZPE built up, more and more waves resulted in more and more collisions and therefore more and more virtual particle pairs. The initial inflation of the universe and therefore the initial conversion of potential to kinetic energy in the ZPE was very rapid at first, as this illustration indicates. So what was the effect on atoms and atomic processes? Everything in us and around us is made up of atoms. Every atom is made up of a nucleus that gets its positive charge from its protons. Surrounding the nucleus are electrons, which are negatively charged. Just as the Casimir effect shows us, when there are fewer ZPE waves, there are fewer virtual particle pairs at any given instant. Since both the ZPE waves themselves, as well as the virtual particles, batter the atoms, when the ZPE was less, the atoms were battered less frequently. This means that the atoms and all subatomic particles were able to move more freely. Look at this picture of the child swinging the ball. The ball continues to go on in that circle because of the string. But what about the electron? Why doesn't an electron go flying off? Or why, if it is spending its own energy flying around the nucleus, doesn't it run out of energy and spiral? into the nucleus. A physicist named Hal Puthoff figured out what was happening in 1987. 
In the case of electrons in stable orbits, the amount of energy the electron used up or radiated as it went around that orbit was exactly balanced by the amount of energy it was getting from the ZPE. As Patoff pointed out, the zero-point energy is responsible for maintaining all atomic orbits right throughout the universe. What is going to be important here in just a minute is that when the ZPE strength was different, there would have been a corresponding change in the electron's orbit characteristics. The electrons move around the nucleus in different energy levels. The closer to the nucleus, the greater the magnitude of the energy. That means, as well, that the closer the electron is to the nucleus, the more energy it will take to either displace it or to remove it from the atom entirely. When the zero-point energy was lower, the magnitude of each of an atom's energy levels in proportion to each other was also lower. Before discussing that, let's first consider this. Even though the ZPE is keeping the electron where it belongs relative to the nucleus, an electron can and does get knocked out of its orbit. It will snap back to its place pretty quickly. But what happens in that process is that the energy it took to push it out of its orbit is then released as a photon of light when it snaps back. That's where light comes from. The more energy it takes to shove an electron out of its place, the more energy will be released as a photon of light when it snaps back into place. The more energetic the light is, the bluer it is. The light we see is actually only a very small part of something called the electromagnetic spectrum. The most high energy waves are shown here on the left. They are gamma rays, X-rays are next, slightly less energetic, and then, just before light we can see, are the ultraviolet rays. Of the colours we can see, purple and blue are the most energetic part of the scale, and the reds are the less energetic side of visible light. Continuing down the less energetic end of the spectrum, we get the infrared rays, waves, then microwaves, and finally radio waves. What is really interesting is that every element produces a slightly different kind of light. You know how the products we buy in the market have a barcode on them which identifies the product to the computer. There's something like a specific barcode in the lines of light produced by each element. In this way, we can look at the lines through a spectroscope and see what element is producing the light we're looking at. Incidentally, that is how we know what stars are made of. Here on Earth, we know exactly where each of these lines from each of these elements belongs. This is called the laboratory standard and is shown here for three elements. It is in this context that astronomers have found something very strange when they looked out into the distant reaches of space. The light coming back to Earth had the right lines in it for each element, but those lines were all shifted to the red end of the spectrum a little bit. This diagram illustrates the situation. The laboratory standard or reference wavelengths for these spectral lines is shown at the bottom. In the middle is a nearby galaxy whose spectral lines are shifted to the red end of the spectrum. At the top, it can be seen that a very distant galaxy has its spectral lines shifted a considerable way into the red region. Indeed, the further out they checked, the more red shifted the spectral lines of the galaxies were. What was going on? One explanation for this effect was based on something we've known about for a long time, something that happens with sound. It's called the Doppler effect. You can hear it every time a siren passes you. The sound of the siren approaching is loud and high. Then, as it passes you, the sound suddenly drops its pitch. This illustration explains why. As the ambulance is coming towards you, its sound waves are getting squished together, so they are closer together, and that means more energy, and that means a higher pitch to the sound. But, as the ambulance passes you, it's pulling away from its own sound waves, and so they're stretching out. 
that means they have less energy and so the pitch is lower. So the common explanation for the redshift is the Doppler effect. Therefore it's presumed that objects in the universe with redshifted light must be moving away from us. As a result, we are seeing light waves being stretched in the same way that sound waves can be. Thus the farther away the object, the greater the redshift. So far so good. That is what we're seeing. This is the first accepted explanation for the redshifting of light from distant galaxies. However, there is a problem with this explanation, as pointed out by Meisner, Thorne and Wheeler on page 767 of their reference book on gravitation. The redshift measurements as far out as can be measured are so high that some astronomers are saying these galaxies must be racing away from us at nearly the speed of light. If that were true, then the distant galaxies we see out there should be violently disrupting from the motion itself. On the left is the way a disrupted galaxy looks. On the right is what we usually see. Disruption is not usually occurring out there. The second explanation is related to it. This explanation for the redshift involves the expansion of space itself instead of galaxies racing away from each other through space. According to this theory, as the universe expands, everything in it grows farther and farther apart. Therefore, as space expands, the light waves in transit through space get stretched as well. This makes their wavelengths longer and in so doing produces the red shift. The concept is illustrated by a wave of a given length drawn on a rubber band. When the rubber band is stretched, the wavelength gets longer. To see what is wrong with the expanding of space idea, let's take a look at what a typical redshift shows us. No matter how far out we look, and no matter how redshifted a light signature is, the widths of the black and coloured lines remains the same. If the redshift were due to space expanding, then the further out the redshift, the wider the lines should be. This is because every photon of light is a very tiny bit of the rainbow spectrum, made up of all those wavelengths. Thus, as the wavelengths stretch, the signature stripes should show this by becoming wider as well. This is not what we see. But there is another problem with both of those standard explanations for the redshift. If the redshift were due to any sort of expansion, we would expect the measurements as we go out from our local group of galaxies to show a smooth transition from one measurement to the next all the way out. This would be a bit like a car on a highway increasing its speed. It increases gradually, smoothly and steadily. But in 1976, William Tift, an astronomer in Arizona, discovered something. He checked, he rechecked. Other astronomers like Guthrie and Napier, Arp, Nalaka, Hoyle, Burbage and others, doubting what he had found, also checked. What they all found was this. No matter what direction they looked in, and no matter how far out the measurements of the redshift were made, they were clumping together over a distance. Then, suddenly, further out, they switched to a higher measurement with no graduating measurements in between. In this diagram, the nearer redshifts are at the top. It may look like the more distant ones on the bottom are not as big, but if you look at the x-axis measurements along the bottom of each of the three graphs, you'll see they are quite a bit larger than the nearer ones at the top. As already mentioned, a number of astronomers doubting Tift's discovery have tried to disprove it, but those jumps in measurements stay there. This is called the quantized redshift, but sometimes it is also referred to as redshift periodicity. This is what it appears to be like from our position on Earth. There are what seem to be spherical shells of redshift going out from our position in space. Each redshift shell has a definite thickness, then a jump to the next value, 
rather than a smooth transition from one to the next. On this diagram, the shell system is cut across the middle and so appear as circles. Because of this, some have claimed this proves the Earth is at the centre of the universe. But the actual fact is that no matter where you stood in the universe, the redshifts would have this same shell-like appearance. This is because no matter where you are in the universe, the closest objects would not show any redshift since you are close to them. It is only as you go to objects further and further out that the redshift value increases. So no, the Earth is not the centre of the universe. Well, is there another possible cause for the redshift? Yes, but first think about something. If you are trying to push a heavy object, like a chest of drawers or a heavy carton, you have to push pretty hard to overcome the fact that the object prefers not to move. Then, when you push hard enough, it jerks forward. This is not a totally accurate picture, because once you get the box moving, it's easier to keep it moving. But the idea of a jerk in movement with enough energy is important. The atom is a finely tuned machine. The energy the electrons expend in their movement is exactly balanced by the amount of energy they get back from the zero-point energy. This balance produces a stable orbit. Like a heavy piece of furniture, the atom resists change. But if the ZPE changes, the atom can only resist for so long and then it has to readjust to the difference in the energy coming in. Remember, in the earliest years of our universe's history, the zero-point energy was building, and quite rapidly at first. This graph shows the approximate rate of the building of the ZPE. And every atom in the universe had to adjust to this. As the ZPE built, more energy was imparted to each atom. This means that when an electron was shoved out of its orbit, it took progressively more energy to do that. Consequently, that greater energy was released in the form of a photon as it flipped back to its proper position. Atoms could only resist for a certain amount of time as that energy built. At the beginning, the ZPE was building so fast that the light emitted from each atom in the universe was changing rapidly. Because of these rapid changes, the jumps occurred very frequently. But, after each change or jump, atoms would resist another change until the energy building was again too much to resist. At each jump, all electron orbits would change simultaneously and in mathematical proportion. If you recall, the visible colours, the colours we see, are a small part of the whole electromagnetic wave spectrum. The red colour is at the less energy side of the spectrum, and the energy increases through the colours until you reach violet. Thus, the more energy it takes to move an electron out of its orbit, the more energy will be released when it flips back, and thus the bluer the emitted light will be. When we look progressively deeper into space, we are looking progressively further back in time. This means that we are viewing those periods when the ZPE strength was systematically lower than now. Therefore, the further out we look, we should be able to see redder and redder light, light emitted from atoms before the ZPE was as high as it is now. On this model, the original atoms did not have the energy the ZPE gave them later in time. Thus the light at the beginning appears to us to have been very, very redshifted, or lazier. As the atoms gained energy from the building zero-point energy, their light also became more energetic or bluer. So our laboratory standards are actually showing the light here as blue shifted from the original redder light emitted when the universe was young. The increasing ZPE also gives a reason for the quantized redshift measurements, which other models cannot. When we look past our own galaxy and post those in our local group, we often use radio telescopes which are connected to computers which then change the radio waves into images. The further out we look, the further back in time we are seeing. 
These radio telescopes have picked up two very interesting things about the redshift. First, they've seen several galaxies with a redshift change or jump going right through the middle of them. Second, with some galaxies, they've been able to record a change in the redshift during our lifetimes. They could see a galaxy change its redshift by one quantum jump as the light actually became bluer. Only the ZP model could account for these observations. We were actually able to watch this quantum jump in measurements happen and there was no easy transition from one measurement to another. It was a jump. Neither the expanding space model nor the Doppler shift model with its rapid motion of galaxies can account for these facts. Astronomer Tift was first to discover these data and, in, and his 2014 book Redshift Key to Cosmology gives full details. It needs to be noted that the zero-point energy has been known about for over a hundred years, but standard physics simply treated it as an abstract mathematical idea until the early 1960s. It was only after the 1960s that the reality of the zero-point energy became accepted. Today, NASA is interested in it, as are a number of scientists in fields of physics and energy. They are each looking for a way to harness some of that incredible energy for use on Earth. We can measure the redshift as we look further and further out into space. Since it seems the redshift is the product of the zero-point energy, that means that we can tell from the redshifts what the zero-point energy was like through time. The extremely high redshifts out as far as we can see tell us that the zero-point energy started off very low and then built rapidly with time as it levelled off. Because of this inverse relationship between the redshift and the zero-point energy, their graphs are the exact opposites of each other. This information on how the zero-point energy has behaved allows us to know what changes have occurred in the electric and magnetic properties of the vacuum of space over the lifetime of the universe. A number of consequences are expected to occur for electromagnetic processes, some of which were faster when the zero-point energy strength was lower. The outcome is that the behaviour of plasma and atomic phenomena are affected with time, and this has repercussions in astronomy and geology. The outcome of all this in astronomy, geology, plasma physics and atomic physics will be discussed in subsequent presentations, so please stay tuned for this, and thank you very much for your time and attention.